good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining our latest Saints Talk, um, short presentations by leading members of our academic community on subjects that we hope are of general interest. I'd also like to welcome you to our first ever virtual alumni weekend. Uh, I hope you can join us for other events uh, both this evening and on Sunday uh, when we'll put a link uh, to the chat bar uh, so that you can look through the rest of the um, event schedule. My name is David Williams. Uh, I look after the alumni and supporter relationship with St Andrews and I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Vincent Yannick. Professor Yannick is director of the Scottish Oceans Institute which is home to the Sea Mammal Research Unit in the School of Biology here at St Andrews. He was a postdoctoral research fellow at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the USA and he's editor of the Springer Book of Animal Signals and Communication, as well as being on the editorial board of the Journal of Animal Cognition. His research involves vocal communications and bioacoustics in marine mammals and the evolution of complexity in animal communication and cognition. Professor Yannick will talk for about 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, if you want to ask a question, we'll have questions at the end and you can do so by putting the question into the taskbar. Uh, if you put your full name, uh, I'm unable to publish it for data protection reasons, so um, please just put your, your first name or ask anonymously. We'll aim to finish about 10 to 6 Scotland time. And now over to Professor Yannick. Professor, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, David, and thank you all for joining us here this afternoon. Um, in my talk today, uh, Marine Mammal Bioacoustics, How Whales, Dolphins and Seals Use Sound in the Ocean, I want to give you just some examples of how we study this topic here um, at the Scottish Oceans Institute. The Scottish Oceans Institute um, has members from four different schools at the University of St Andrews. That's the School of Biology, the School of Mathematics and Statistics, the School of um, Environmental and Earth Sciences, and the School of Geography and Sustainable Development. And we're all together here in this new building, as you can see, that we're very proud of and very happy to be in. Um, what we also have at the Scottish Oceans Institute is the Sea Mammal Research Unit. And interestingly, that is in fact the largest marine mammal research unit in the world. And what this unit that I'm part of is studying um, are marine top predators as climate and ecosystem sentinels. So we are studying these animals really um, to kind of get an indication of ocean health in general. What I want to start out with today um, is to tell you a little bit about the marine environment and just mm, let you think for a moment what it is like to be in it. Um, I have a little video here of some bottlenose dolphins, and I'm sure you've seen material like this before. Um, and at the at the first sight, it looks like they um, it's very good visibility. You can see the animals pretty well. But the marine environment is difficult because it is very uniform. And as you see some of these animals swim away, you see that they disappear pretty quickly. Um, so even though these animals are only a few tens of eight meters away, they are out of sight. And of course, this is a good scenario because we're close to the surface where there is still some sunlight. Um, and also, this is relatively clear water. A lot of um, marine environments are a lot um, um, murkier um, with turbid waters where you have less visibility than that. So one of the key things that these animals are uh, uh, facing as a challenge is that they somehow have to manage to stay together in this very uniform environment. And I have a list here of different problems that, they, that they're facing. Low visibility is one. The next one is no, no olfactory cues. So they can't use smell, but, which is a sense that a lot of other mammals use for this kind of purpose. There are very few landmarks. If animals are near the coast, there might be some landmarks, but if you're in the open ocean, there are no landmarks to go back to and find where you were. So points of reference are really kind of absent. For mothers and their offspring, there's no den. Animals can't just go back and deposit their offspring somewhere and then come back to them. So they always have to swim together. Um, also, the currents move individuals without them actively swimming. And if you're a diver and you've ever been diving in currents, you know that you move with the body of water around you and you're actually not aware that you're moving at all. But when you come up to the surface again, you are really at a completely different place from where you started. And then, of course, there's pressure. 
as these animals dive down, the pressure increases. And what that does is that it changes the shape and size of the air cavities in their heads that they use to produce sounds. And what that means is that their voices change. So it's not so easy to use voice characteristics to recognize who's around you. And then finally, there's high background noise in general in that environment. Now, if I look at sound in general, this is an animation here that shows you um, sound as a longitudinal wave. And if you look at each individual dot, you will see that each, any, uh, it doesn't matter which one you pick, um, that each dot is just oscillating back and forth in place. But as you kind of step back, you see that there is kind of a wave front moving from left to right. And that's really what sound is. It's this pressure wave that travels through the medium, no matter whether that's air or whether that's water. Now in water, the advantage is that um, sound travels four times faster than in air, and also there's much less transmission loss. So what that means is that um, sounds can be heard over much greater ranges. And you may have heard before that some of the large whales, like the baleen whales, can hear each other over hundreds or sometimes maybe even thousands of kilometers. Now at the surface, that sounds great because it means it's easy to stay in touch. You can hear each other over long distances. But there is a flip side to this coin. Imagine you are sitting where you are sitting right now and you could hear everyone talking within 10 to 100 kilometers of you right now. If that was your acoustic reality, it's not just easy um, um, to get in touch with someone else because everyone else is making sounds as well and that creates extra biological background noise that the animals have to deal with. Nevertheless, um, sounds are really the best way of staying in touch for these animals um, and is used extensively by marine animals in general. Now, today I want to give you really three examples of how sound is important to marine mammals. And I want to talk about communi communication, of course, active use of sounds, particularly in dolphins. Um, I want to talk um, about passive acoustics, how the animals use sound that they hear, and then also a little bit about the effects of noise and not just the biological noise I just mentioned, but particularly anthropogenic noise, noise that we introduce into the oceans. Now let's start out by listening to some examples. Um, I'm sure you all heard marine mammal sounds before. The most famous one perhaps is the sound of the humpback whale. And here are some examples I recorded in Hawaii in 2018. So that was the humpback whales, and these are males producing those songs that can last for long periods of time. They sometimes sing for hours. Let's listen to the bearded seal from the Arctic, um, Art Arctic Oceans. So very different sound that you hear here, but it's the same scenario. It's males producing sounds um, to attract females and to keep other males away. All of these are underwater recordings. Now for these sounds, we kind of have a pretty good idea what they're for because they're produced by males and they're, they're uh, producing song, kind of similar to birds really um, and um, bird song. The particular sounds I'm interested in are from different animals and the ones that I want to talk about today are from bottlenose dolphins. Um, dolphins produce whistles and I just produced, uh, have two short examples here that I'm going to play for you. This is one and a different one. So these are kinds of individual whistles and they're using sound in a different way. They don't produce song. It's males and females producing whistles. And they're producing them a lot more in social interactions, just like we do or like um, primates do, for example. So when we're studying these kinds of um, these kinds of whistles, what we have is we have, um, first of all, a huge variety that we somehow have to categorize. And these are little um, squares here. Each of those is a different whistle type in the dolphin's repertoire. Um, you have frequency on the x-axis here and time on the y-axis. And, um, and so, each of those is one specific whistle type. Um, these are being categorized by neural network systems that analyze these 
uh, frequency contour modulations and then put them together and you say see that there's variability between them quite a bit and that's partly because the animals and also the computer program uses time warping to to compare whistles because sometimes dolphins produce longer or shorter whistles of the same shape same shape and that's what you see here now with all these um, whistle types that they have and this is only a subset of a dolphin repertoire um, we can look at how often those are being used so this is here a study where we recorded bottlenose dolphins for three months and each line is um, the occurrence of a particular whistle type in its repertoire. Um, and so what you have is that on the first sampling day there's a few whistles here that we can of course record right away and we record them all the way through um, the study period. And then what happens is that there are some that are rarer so we have to wait quite a bit of time into our study period until we first hear them. So there's some very common whistles and some rarer whistles, but overall in the repertoire, we find that the animals easily have um, sometimes hundreds of whistles in their repertoires. So we started with the low hanging fruit and looked at those whistles that are most common. And in fact, um, very early on in dolphin studies, people have recognized that there are some whistles that animals produce over and over again. And in fact, as early as the 60s, the cold worlds have, rec have recognized these whistles as being individual um, identification signals. They're so-called signature whistles. And you see four examples here, three repetitions of each. So each line is a different animal. And these are the whistles these animals produce when they're separated from the rest of their group. And you see that they're very, very different between those four animals. You see the bottlenose dolphin here carrying a little device on the back. That's a suction cup D tag, a recording tag with which we record sounds of dolphins. And they come off very easily and the animals can tolerate them um, without much drag on them. Um, and that way we can record um, on board the animals, so to speak. Now, how do dolphins use these signature whistles? Well, to answer that question, um, we want to look at wild groups. So um, all of the work that I'm talking about now um, was carried out here just off St. Andrews. So in fact, in St. Andrews Bay, where we have a resident bottlenose dolphin population that travels up and down the east coast of Scotland. And the way we, we, we study that is with different hydrophones. So we bring out hydrophone arrays because what's important to find out how dolphins use whistles is to know who's making the whistle. So I'm showing you a quick video here um, on how this works. So if you have dolphins producing sounds at each other, what we do is we have three hydrophones, underwater microphones in the water. Now one dolphin's coming up here producing a sound, the other one's receiving it, and I want to know who's producing the sound. So here you see as the sound comes, there's different peaks down here, which are the times of arrival of that sound. And if I take those times of arrival and compare them, then for each pair of those arrival differences, I can draw a line of possible locations where the animal could have been to create that. With three such, um, such um, lines, I have one spot in which they all intersect. And that's in fact the location where the animal is. So that's just in a nutshell, very easily explained how we do that. Now, um, this is what this looks like um, when we actually do this in real life. So this is us out in the boat here in the Tay Estuary with some dolphins with us. Um, this, this here on the right hand side is the, an overhead view of the boat with the four hydrophones all around it. And these are these hyperboles, these um, um, lines that I just um, showed you that are possible put, um, positions of the animal. And this is where they all intersect. So this is where the dolphin was in this particular case. And with this, with this met method, what we could do is we could start to look at different groups interacting as they come towards each other. And what we found is that they don't really whistle very much if they just pass each other. But if, if dolphins actually join up at sea, what happens is that they're exchanging whistles. So these spectrograms, again, again frequency over time, here shows these whistle contours, again, of one dolphin. And then you have this multi-looped one here, this one multi-oscillatory um, whistle by the other dolphin. And the same here, this is a different encounter, one animal producing this whistle, the other one producing this one up here. And they're kind of overlapping and going back and forth. And then finally one down here where you have two um, whistles that look kind of similar. You have this up sweep here and then something that looks like an M, which is the other whistle. And that goes back and forth as well. We can listen to that last one. It's quite high pitched and fast, but I'll play it anyway. And that's two dolphins um, um, in a way introducing themselves to each other and then joining um, the group and then swimming together as one social group afterwards. So this is one of the ways in which they use these signature whistles. 
Now, it's interesting to see that they use it like that, but dolphins can also copy whistles. And so what we sometimes found was that you have these matching pairs. So in column B here, again, the spectrograms, you have two upsweeps here, again, produced by two different dolphins. And again, these kind of um, different types of shapes. And um, on the left hand side, you see exchanges that are not of the same shape. Now, it's interesting to look at these here because that suggests that maybe dolphins can actually address each other with these whistles because they can copy them. So if I know the signature whistle of another one and I'm looking for them, I can maybe um, copy that animal score and try to find it. So we tested that in a playback experiment, um, experiment um, again, just out here to play back signature whistles to groups and see whether the dolphins actually react to their own signature whistle as well. And what you usually see in those scenarios is that they're exchanging and calling back with their own signature whistle. And that's exactly what we found. Here are a couple of examples. Again, the very dark traces here are our playback. So that's an underwater speaker playing a sound. Um, and it's very dark because we're close to it. And then you see just very faintly another one here. That's the reply by the dolphin. And these um, values here are similarity values on a scale of one to five between the original and the, and the match. Now, this lower one here, I actually have slowed down so that you can listen to it. You will hear a very loud whistle, first of all, which is the playback, and then a very quiet one, which is the reply. So you may have to turn it up a little bit for the replies. I'm going to play it. This is lower pitched because it's slowed down. So that was the playback, and now we will hear it. Second loud whistle, second playback, and another ripple. So in these playback experiments, we can test our ideas or hypotheses, what these whistles mean and how they're being used. And if you're thinking about talking to dolphins, that's what we're doing here. We're basically addressing animals with their own sounds, and they are replying to us. But what's exciting about this is not so much that we are doing this, but that we actually find something out about how this system works and how these animals communicate with each other. Now I want to switch now to the second topic um, and also a different species. I want to look at passive acoustics and briefly talk to you about the gray seal, another species that's very common around the shores here. Um, and in gray seals, um, uh, they produce sounds themselves, but they're also uh, very good at listening to sounds and using sounds in the environment to learn about food and find where, to, where uh, and find food as well. Now, um, what I want to talk about now are um, fish tags that we're using. So actually noise that's introduced by humans. And I have an example here that I'm holding up. I hope you can see this. It's a kind of small little um, black rod, um, and this is an active acoustic tag. And what that's used for is scientists put these into fish like salmon or tuna, um, and um, they then produce a sound. And what they then do is put out again underwater microphones in the environment to try to mark and recapture those fish, which means that um, if you put lots of microphones out, hopefully you hear those tags and you can tell um, how many of those um, go where and also how many return. This is an example here of a quite an extensive network of these kinds of hydrophone arrays, all these kind of little red dots all around that um, 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 American West Coast um, are um, recording stations that can record these types of tags. And you can find them here up in Alaska as well, all along the coast. So this is really to kind of uh, monitor fish populations and see where the animals come back. Now, one of the obvious questions about that is if we have marine mammals that eat fish and that can hear very well, is whether they react to those sounds and whether they use them in some way. And um, we are actually quite regularly acoustically marking of uh, prey locations um, for animals. So that not just in this kind of example, but also you see a fish farm here on the right hand side. Fish farms produce a variety of different sounds. There are acoustic deterrent devices, there are operational noises, and all of that, of course, also indicates to animals where the farms are. Now, on the left hand side here, you see this bucket, and that's an experiment that we did that I just want to show you briefly where we did um, put these tags with fish in different boxes. They had about 20 boxes to choose from. Um, and the animals, without any training, learned very quickly um, where the right box is um, that actually has the accessible fish with a pinger on it. And what you see here is an underwater video of the seal coming in getting going to the right box, getting out a fish and swimming on. So what we found here is that without any training, just by being exposed to these noises, the animals learn that this um, little ping that this pinger produces means food. 
And of course, that has an has an uh, implication for those kinds of studies because it suggests that maybe those uh, tax studies um, are somewhat compromised by higher predation pressure. Um, but it also is interesting to look at this in a wider field of how we use noise in the oceans and how animals sometimes take advantage of those kinds of noises. Now, my final example um, is one uh, in which I want to talk about ocean noise that we introduce. Um, this infographic here kind of summarizes this. You have a right whale on the left hand side and then all the way one on the right hand side. And if these animals want to communicate through sound, somehow the sound has to make it through the environment. And there's lots of other noise there. There's other biological noise like other whales, but also other fish, for example, or things like lightning or wind and rain that produce surface noise. But then, of course, there's also the human aspect. Shipping is a huge um, um, issue in that context. We, there's uh, extensive shipping throughout all oceans, and that introduces a lot of noise into the environment. Um, the oil and gas industry is using very loud noise sources to um, explore um, the, the, the seafloor, which also creates noise. They're called air guns. And then the other thing you have on here is a submarine, and there's some noise going off from the submarine. But actually, one of the key things that um, have been uh, brought um, into context uh, of whale strandings is underwater sonar that's being used to detect submarines. So this is sonar, not the sonar by the submarines as well themselves. Submarines usually try not to be detected. Um, this is sonar that surface vessels use to detect submarines. And these kinds of surface vessels often have a bow sonar here. Um, and that is being used to um, produce audible sounds that can um, uh, help to detect submarines at sea. Now I'm going to spend, uh, play you an example down here in a second. That's relatively loud. So if you have your speakers all the way up, uh, I recommend that you just briefly turn them down a little bit before I press it. So I'm going to do that now. And you heard there that there was a kind of echo already of this particular sound. And this is a sound that has been brought into um, connection and um, in fact been accepted as one of the causes for whale strandings when, um, um, when these exercises are being carried out uh, near whales. And one of the um, types of whales that are particularly affected by that are beaked whales. Now, there are different kind of aspects to these sounds that one can study. One of them is how loud they are, of course. That's always the kind of first thing that people look at. And um, this little depiction here of sound amplitude is how represents how loud the sound is. And we have, have um, a lot of knowledge and studies now on how animals react to, to what's called a received level of a sound. But there are other aspects that um, animals react to of sound. And one of them is the rise time. It's how sudden the onset is, how sudden the sound is. And just imagine someone, if you stand next to a door that suddenly um, gets thrown shut, you flinch. And that flinch is what we call a startle reflex. It's in fact located in your brainstem. And that little flinch is something that kind of gets you ready to escape if there is, if there is um, any kind of danger around. But um, what it also does, and what we found in our work with gray seals, is that the animals, when they're repeatedly exposed to those kinds of sounds, at the start, there's just a flinch, like the one I described. But over time, they sensitize to these sounds and um, avoid them more and more. And so one of the things that we studied was we wanted to see how the animals react to those different rise times, whether it's actually, in fact, just that sudden onset that perhaps causes the animals to escape. And um, again, I want to show you briefly how we're studying this. So um, I've shown you that little tag on the back of the bottlenose dolphin earlier. This is the tag again. Now we're going to see trying to attach this to a wild animal. And this is how this is done. We're attaching the tag that you see here at the top at, to a very long pole. And then you go out on a boat and what you do is you are tagging a whale. So this is a previous beaked whale that's just coming to the surface. These are very deep diving whales. And what we do is we're going alongside and then we're pressing that um, suction cup tag onto its skin. The tag then travels with the whale and gives us information on the sound it makes, the sounds it hears, and also how deep it's going and how fast it is going. And these kinds of tags are being used widely in marine mammal science now. And what's great about them is that you can actually time when they're coming off. They're very, very clever little design with devices that have little computers in them. And in fact, they can um, flood the suction cups and the suction cup can then release and you can set a time when that's coming off. And then we have to collect the tag because it's what's called an archival tag and get the data of it at the end.
And so just I want to finish with um, an example slide here of just one animal that has been tagged in that way. So there's, this is a graph that shows you the depth, how deep the animal is going, and this is the hour of the day, this is time. So we tagged the animal up here where we have the first kind of contact with the animal. It then went down to several hundred meters, almost to a thousand meters. And all these little dots here, these little colored dots, are um, sounds that the animal makes while it's foraging here. And then it comes back up to the surface and it, and, and, and it covered about a kilometer's distance at this at a speed point of 0.3 meters per second. We then expose the animals to very brief sounds that are just very sudden in their onset. So not the sound that I just played to you as a Navy, but just the aspect of a sudden onset that I want to study. And what happens next is interesting. First of all, you don't see any colored dots anymore. The animals are falling quiet. They're not making any sounds and they're increasing their speed. Um, quite dramatically to 1.25 meters per second. And um, we eventually picked up the tag again and the animal at 12 kilometers distance from, um, from where it was originally. So quite a strong response of this animal to a relatively short um, sound and one that is definitely much quieter than the Navy saunas that are being produced um, in their environment. So this is, um, brings me to an end of uh, these few examples, and I hope that that was informative and interesting, um, showing you how sounds are uh, important to these animals for their own communication, but also how they're affected by us. And of course, there are lots more of these kinds of examples. Before I hand back to David, though, and listen to questions, um, I just want to thank the people that were involved in all of this work. Of course, all the members of, of my group here over the years, um, and of course, also not last but not least, uh, very importantly, the funders, the National Environment Research Council, and also the Office of Neighbor Research that enabled us to do this kind of work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Professor Yannick. Um, and we're now going to move to the to the question portion. Um, we've got about 20 minutes for that. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please type one into the chat bar and, and I'll either publish it or, or, or ask, the, ask the professor um, verbally. So um, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to put a uh, survey into the chat bar. So if you've enjoyed the talk, if you've got any feedback, uh, if you'd like to suggest other talks we could do in the future, um, please do take part in our survey. That's, it's really helpful to have um, to have your feedback in, in, and information. So I, I'm going to start with um, my own question. Um, there are a lot of uh, very clever animals out in the world that people think might some have some sort of language ability. How does dolphin and whale communication compare to that of dogs or chimpanzees that we're maybe more familiar with? Yeah, that's a really good question and one that I'm being asked a lot. Obviously, there is this idea of dolphin language out there and people assume that their communication is very, very complex. Um, I'm very interested in those comparisons because um, I think that sometimes um, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves uh, in terms of what we're assuming animals can, can do. Um, first of all, in terms of the comparisons, I think that um, certainly all of these animal dogs, chimpanzees, dolphins, um, have advanced what we call cognitive abilities, if you want kind of increased um, or advanced intelligence, if you want. Um, and, and they're mostly using that in their social interactions. Um, all of these animals um, produce a variety of sounds. One of the differences really is that dolphins also are able to copy sounds and to learn new sounds. So this is something that really sets them apart from dogs and chimpanzees, um, that they can learn new sounds. And what that means is that they theoretically can enlarge their repertoire um, and learn new sounds and um, use those sounds in new contexts. And you can already see that that um, theoretically at least increases the potential for communication um, in the system. However, having said that, um, the animals themselves are, um, of course, in their day to day lives using these sounds a lot in the same kind of social interactions as dogs or chimpanzees do in their social societies. So I don't think that the actual use of sound is, is all that different. I think one of the reasons why they, they use vocal learning is um, because of this incredible diversity of um, sounds that they're encountering, the challenges they have when they're trying to communicate in noise, and of course the scenario where you have new whistles with every new dolphin you meet, so to speak, and to be able to communicate, you gotta be able to copy those sounds. Um, I think the question of language is a difficult one because to me language is the human communication system. 
um, and not an animal communication system. And that's not to put us aside or, 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 or um, try to imply that ours is better. It's really just to imply that it's different. I think to assume that animals have a language that is like human language um, is uh, a little far-fetched. And actually what's interesting in all of these sounds is all the differences in which these animals use sound differently from ours. I think um, um, we probably um, kind of ignore some interesting opportunities if we're only, th only looking for um, an animal that has reference and syntax and perhaps uses sentences in the way as we do. So um, definitely a complex communication system, but I would say very different from human language. Thanks, Professor. And uh, you mentioned uh, the, the identity whistles there. I've got a question from Marta. Uh, when you record the whistles of bottlenose dolphins, how do you know if a dolphin is producing its own signature whistle or calling for another dolphin by producing another dolphin signature whistle or being a cunning mimic? mimic? Yes, that's a really good question. So, um, and actually one that we thought about quite some time, because if we think that these signature whistles are for individual recognition, the more they get copied, the less they are good for individual recognition, because you can never be sure whether it's actually the dolphin that owns the signature whistle or whether it's somebody copying. But what you actually find in reality is that these copies are really rare. Uh, most of the animals, uh, most of the time, the animals swim in close contact with the animals that they want to be with. And um, another um, ability that they have that I haven't mentioned yet, of course, is echolocation. Um, the dolphins produce active sounds uh, just like bats that go out and then can listen to the echoes. So that's another way of use of sound in which they can um, track where other animals are. That has a bit of a, a longer range than just um, um, the visual channel where, we, where they can just try to see them. So um, it's a little difficult to tell who is making the sound, whether it's the owner of the signature whistle or someone copying. But one thing we found is that it seems that the animals, when they're copying sounds, even though they're very good at copying sounds, it seems like they are consistently introducing little variations that when you're producing a copy, it sounds a little bit different from the actual owner's whistle. Um, just a little flourish or a little different modulation pattern in it. And we think that that might actually be on purpose. It's possible that that's not just an error, but that the animals are actually marking that they're just copying um, to not confuse the system. Um, we don't really know this for certain yet, but this is kind of one of the assumptions. But it's interesting to see that um, um, an animal that's so good at copying always introduces what seems to be a little error. Um, we think that has a purpose. Thanks, Perez. We, we've had uh, three uh, separate questions on uh, noise from, from shipping and, and other human sources. Um, what measures this from Alex? I'll put them all together, but you'll get the general thing. What what measures can be taken to mitigate acoustic stresses from shipping? Uh, and to what extent are they being adopted around the world? Are there any international agreements to minimize ocean uh, noise pollution? And if a ship is causing whale strandings, could ships be modified to make less sound? And are some types of ships better than others? OK, yeah, that's a that's a um, large range of questions. And um, yes, first of all, the short answer is there are mitigation measures. But of course, as always, um, they're all a question of um, investments. Um, so ships can be made quieter. And of course, there are some examples of very quiet ships. A good example is the submarine that I talked about. Like they can hardly be heard at all. That's why we need active sonar to actually try to detect them. So there is very sophisticated technology trying to make ships very quiet. Um, one of the key um, um, sources of noise in ship propellers is cavitation. And um, that is um, uh, something that happens um, as a propeller moves through the water at high speed. It creates these cavitation bu bubbles that implode and that produce very loud noise. That can be managed by different propeller designs, but of course it is a kind of um, also question of um, a balance between um, energy used and um, thrust gotten from the propeller. So as you're producing, um, as you're producing more and more sophisticated propellers, you also have to um, use more energy then to propel the ship. Um, so there are kind of uh, problems like that. I'm not an engineer, so I can't in detail tell you exactly the, the um, um, uh, mitigation measures that are available. Um, however, they are there and can be used. Um, how widely are they being used across the world? Well, um, 
investments in new ships obviously are considering noise and that is something that happens but as you probably know ships have an incredibly long um, shelf life um, or well not shelf life active life i should say um, and so a lot of vessels that are out there actually are relatively old um, so again it's a question of investment um, for international agreements uh, generally there is obviously communication between different countries um, most countries kind of regulate noise within their own um, territorial waters. So you do have work groups and efforts um, on a national level. One interesting example where um, things are more international is around Antarctica, where um, you have no one particular country owning the territory. And there you have um, international agreements and uh, at least exchange of information. But all of these things are kind of in progress and um, they are obviously improving the situation um, over time, um, but I think that um, kind of international collaboration, especially offshore, especially when we're going you know, into the other oceans, not just around Antarctica, um, is something that is difficult to regulate. Um, we have some people in the School of Geography and Sustainable Development who work on regulations, and uh, we should probably talk to them about what the best way forward is. A couple of uh, interesting uh, questions on 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 that particular thing, but Juliet, at what age do dolphins start making their own signature whistles? Yes, that's a good one too. So um, there isn't very many studies on that. I remember I, I showed that little video that um, told you how we know where the sounds coming from with the different types of microphones, um, different hydrophones in different positions. When you have a mother and, and um, a calf, they're swimming most of the time very close to each other. And as you can imagine, these methods have errors. So it's very difficult to tell which sound comes from the mother and which one comes from the calf. Having said that though, we have looked in some zoos at when these animals first produce their sounds where you sometimes have them separate briefly. And, um, and we do find that um, the, the animals whistle really pretty much from day one. So they do produce sounds very early on. Um, they also produce echolocation clicks very early on, but at that stage, the sounds are very different from the adult repertoire. So they're a lot more noisy um, and not really very stereotypical. So you don't see those kinds of whistle types yet. However, the actual signature whistle of the animal kind of um, emerges over the first couple of months, pretty much. Um, so again, relatively early, um, but the animal is dependent on the mother and does not have that individual recognition whistle yet um, in the first weeks of its life. So about a month or two really is how long it takes until the animal develops its own whistle. And we've, we've had two questions on, on interspecies communication. Uh, so uh, Volkmar from Germany, uh, are there examples known from marine mammals where the species appear to be communicating with each other? And do dolphins and whales use different types of whistles when communicating with humans than when communicating within their own species. And that was from Sana. Yes. OK, so um, first of all, do they um, communicate with different species? Interestingly, you have different types of whistle patterns when you have mixed species groups. So if you have two dolphin species and you are uh, recording them by themselves as single species groups, the types of whistles we find are different from the ones when they are in a mixed group. Now. Um, that can have different reasons. Um, it can be, of course, that there are specific whistles that they use to communicate with the other species. But also, um, if you think about it, it's a very different social context to meet another species. So it's possible that the whistles they're using are still directed at their conspecifics, at whistles at animals of the same species, but they're different because they're in different contexts. They're suddenly meeting another species and they're interacting with another species. Um, I think there definitely is that kind of interaction um, um, between species and there is also um, um, there are observations of social interactions between different species. Um, and so therefore um, there, it's kind of clear that there is communication going on between them in those interactions. So I think they do definitely just, uh, um, um, communicate with other species as well. Um, when it comes to interactions with humans, um, again, the answer is yes, they often use in different sounds when they're addressing people. But that's a really tricky one to study. And the reason for that is um, as animals interact with humans, uh, and this is obviously mostly in zoos where interactions are quite extensive and also people are the ones providing the food, um, you have something that's called kind of um, involuntary training. 
Um, so what we do as we interacting with any animal, in fact, uh, we're giving, you know, our body language is different and the animals are very good observers. They kind of see what works when they are producing sounds. They will produce sounds um, and usually um, to either get attention, to perhaps get access to um, a particular object or to get food. And whatever works, especially with an animal like a dolphin that has that kind of vocal versatility, they will produce a variety of sounds and um, whichever one works is the one they will use. Now, the most interesting experience I had in that context was in a very well-known uh, research lab that I visited that had uh, captive dolphins. Um, and when I walked in and listened to the sounds that these animals made in air, they, they were sounds like I've never heard before of dolphins. They were much lower in frequency and they sounded much, much more like, well, not like human sounds, but certainly more kind of geared towards our hearing level. You've listened to the dolphin whistles that I played earlier that were quite high pitched. They're a little difficult to hear. So these dolphins were producing low frequency sounds. And I think that that was really mostly that that was what worked for them. That was what got them in the attention as an as a person walked past the pool. And so then they put starting to produce those kinds of sounds. And that's the kind of, uh, in a way, the crux if you study vocal learners, because they're so good at producing new sounds that they are employing them in a way that um, um, is best for them themselves. But whether that really um, um, indicates any kind of particular different message um, than I want attention or on fish is, is very kind of difficult to, um, to study and to conclude. But this kind of involuntary training is something that often is in the way when you are studying dolphins that had prolonged interactions with humans. Because as a scientist, you're coming there without knowing that history. You're just um, recording the new sounds and in what context they are given, uh, but you don't know what happened before. And that's that's always something to look out for when studying um, these kinds of interactions. And we, we've had an anonymous question on, on your reading of the effect of human behavior on these animals. Is, is human generated noise an existential threat for any of these species? or is it more like a minor annoyance? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think, um, and one that we should ask ourselves every time we do see um, kind of anthropogenic effects. <clears throat> I think um, in some of the areas, um, it's sometimes surprising, you do find um, some of these animals um, s seemingly um, quite happy um, foraging in right outside very busy harbors, for example, or areas that have very high noise levels. Now, um, if we talk about an existential threat, then there are two levels at which we can look at this. One is at the individual level and the other one is at the population level. So the first question is, is this um, in any way harmful to the individual? Well, if animals are exposed to high noise levels over long periods of time, that will affect their hearing. Um, just like in humans, they, they will go um, um, slightly deaf over time. And that can be a, a particular problem for animals that use sound so extensively. So that's the first worry in those scenarios. And they may become dependent on easily accessible um, food sources. We have anim uh, animals that interact with fisheries, for example, taking food out of, um, out of nets. Um, that's obviously an accumulation of food that is available and that is marked again by um, the fishermen using different types of gear that produces noise that the animals can hear. Um, so animals may become dependent on that and that's not, um, that's not ideal. Um, on the population level, the next question is, of course, if we're looking from that perspective, um, the question is, uh, is it so much of a problem that we potentially um, have decreased um, reproductive success uh, and so therefore a declining population because of noise? Now, in the, in the marine environment, you can imagine there's so many different stresses that these animals are exposed to. And um, even if I just want to look at anthropogenic stresses, there are a huge variety of them. Um, and to kind of really say noise is the one that is um, making the, the, the biggest difference is difficult. However, um, one of the biggest um, areas in marine science at the moment is the effect of um, uh, the cumulative effect or the, the kind of combination of different stresses and how they affect marine life. And noise has certainly been indicated as a, as a very um, dominant one, often kind of having subtle effects, um, something like um, deafening over long periods of time. But uh, for some animals, um, other marine creatures like fish, for example, we now also know that it affects their attention, for example, that it sometimes makes um, either predation more successful or less successful. And all of these effects taken together um, definitely have an effect on, on populations. Um, so I would say, um, 
given the, the, the difficulty of studying such a stressor in isolation, um, knowing what kinds of noise we're introducing and knowing that um, there are definitely examples where negative effect like deafening have been demonstrated, um, that it definitely is something we need to pay attention to. And it is a real threat, not just something that's a minor nuisance. I'm uh, going to move to a, to a final question now. This is from Claire. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. What are the next steps in your research and how do you collaborate with other research centres such as Woods Hall? So um, the, the work's relatively small for us. There isn't that many marine mammal scientists, even though um, obviously there's a lot of TV programmes and it kind of, um, you get the impression that there's lots of research going on. It's actually not that much research, comparatively speaking. So um, there is a big network of people and um, a lot of us have worked in other um, institutions before they came here. I personally have worked at Woods Hole in the past. Um, so we're very closely working with people in other in other places. Um, one close collaboration I have is in fact with Woods Hole, with Leila Saeed, who's um, studying bottlenose dolphins with me, um, um, particularly the signature whistle questions um, that we're studying in Florida. Um, the, for the next steps, um, I've given you a variety of different examples of things that we're working on. Um, for dolphins, one of the key things we're focusing on now um, are the non-signature whistles. So those whistles that are rarer, um, trying to work out in what context they occur, because we've learned a lot about signature whistles. We want to know how these all these skills that they have of uh, vocal copying um, and this versatility affect their communication um, using other sounds. Um, um, for the noise um, aspects, one of the key things there is to look more at the potential sensitization effects of these uh, sudden onset sounds. So one of our worries there is that strandings ultimately, which is a very extreme reaction of an animal obviously to noise, uh, could potentially be caused also by sensitization, that um, animals get more and more sensitive to certain types of noise and so then react more and more strongly, which puts them at greater risk. Um, so that's the next point there. But at the moment, unfortunately, we've been really um, cut short in our research efforts because of the pandemic. Uh, field work had to be cut back quite dramatically, especially international collaborations, as you can imagine. And so we're all waiting here, um, hoping that uh, we'll, we, we have some kind of return to normal, not in the too distant future, so that we can get back out there and continue answering some of those questions. Thank you, uh, Professor, and uh, just to reiterate my, my thanks to you for your time and putting this talk together and, and sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, if, if you haven't filled out the event survey yet, then please do so. Uh, the link is in the chat. Uh, we have another Saints talk coming up on Sunday at 10 a.m. at St Andrew's time. And of course, we have other events going on through the weekend, um, both this evening and uh, all through Sunday. Uh, you can uh, follow us on our YouTube, you can see our other Saints talks on our YouTube channel and also uh, follow us on our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram. And now just to reiterate my thanks to Professor Yannick for his time. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'll hand back to you, Professor, final comment. Thank you all very much for for joining me for this talk. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, I hope you will visit um, lots of the other Saints talks as well. I know they're online. Um, you can even look back um, and um, if you enjoyed them, uh, please explore all the other ones as, as well. And uh, I wish you all um, a lot of fun with the upcoming events in the alumni weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>